Hello, I'm Professor McCoy. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, some oddities in a particular episode of The Mandalorian, um, a particularly notorious one, uh, one that was not uh, particularly good, uh, that being Chapter 22, Guns for Hire. Uh, this is the one, uh, if you don't recognize that in particular, um, you will almost certainly remember the uh, the cameos that appeared in the episode, um, particularly Jack Black and Lizzo as the uh, the sort of co-rulers of this uh, this futuristic democratic city. I do have some critical things to say, but I should uh, caveat this first of all with a couple of things that I'm not really planning on talking about. Um, given that I haven't actually seen uh, the rest of season three of Mandalorian, uh, and I don't really have much interest in doing so uh, from what I've from what I've seen and heard about it. I won't really be commenting on the uh, the elements of this episode that are crucial to the overall plot or relevant to the overall plot uh, of the se of the series or of uh, of the season. Uh, that being the parts really more towards the end, having to do with the Mandalorians themselves. I really just want to talk about the city that they find themselves in and the the political and social conflict in that city. I'm also uh, not really going to address the uh, the elephant in the room. The uh, the cameos by Jack Black and Lizzo that everyone seems to be criticizing the episode for. Um, now, I I could say plenty about uh, about that. I could say I could point out its uh, various silliness and the fundamental unseriousness of any of Jack Black's roles and the fact that he doesn't fit into Star Wars. Uh, the fact that Lizzo is not an actress um, and doesn't act like one. But I think that uh, a lot of uh, a lot of analysts and a lot of critics of the series and of the episode got far too caught up in pointing and laughing at haha silly hollywood cameos uh this which also goes for christopher lloyd who who unlike uh, unlike lizzo and, and even to some degree unlike jack black is a very serious actor and a very good one um even just sort of pointing and making doc brown jokes i don't I, well okay first of all i'm not above doc brown jokes i'm probably going to slip into one or two of them that aside <laughs> I don't want to get caught up in pointing and laughing at the cameos uh, in the episode. I want to look at some of the, the, the sociopolitics of the episode and some of the thematic through lines of the episode. See if we can actually dive deeper into this a little bit, see what we can learn from it. Uh, more so about our world, really, than about uh, than about Star Wars, which, which means that it actually does something of its job as science fiction, even if it doesn't uh, maybe get some things wrong, let's say. So, if you can tell from the video uh, title and or description, um, I'm wanting to look at uh, this episode's attempted critique of democracy, what we can say about its critique of democracy, how we can criticize democracy ourselves, independent of how it says, uh, how it tries to do so and what it has to say about it, and whether it's on the right track, um, whether it has a realistic view of, uh, of democracy, of a democratic governing system such as this, where... Uh, functionally speaking, the means of production are um, are public and taken care of, and so 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 people are not particularly concerned with subsistence. Uh, it's a it is not quite post scarcity, uh, not to the degree of say um, of say Roddenberry's Star Trek, uh, but it is certainly uh, necessities are taken care of, and really people are are more concerned economically with luxuries. And so I want to look at whether the show's depiction of this, and whether also the show's depiction of the socio-political conflict and intrigue within the episode, whether that is uh, in any way realistic. And to look at that, I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be deferring primarily to a field within political theory referred to as public choice theory. Uh, so, I first want to uh, give a brief explanation of public choice theory. This is going to be incomplete, of course, but I will throw some uh, links in the description uh, as well. For more information on public choice theory, from uh, from both both at a summary level and from uh, from some scholars in the field uh, on the subject, so public choice theory uh, is at its essence the realization that uh, those interested and those involved in public politics, so politicians, lobbyists, uh, rulers of any sort, are not simply interested in uh, in rulership in the interests of, say, the polis, of the, the political union, but have their own interests and incentives as well, and that we shouldn't ignore those. We should examine what those interests are, what those incentives are, and how those incentive structures will lead them to governing in a certain way. Now, in a democracy, 
in a, particularly in uh, in a democratic system like this, uh, which we would typically, uh, in terms of science fiction, uh, science, fi science fiction statecraft, let's say, we would typically refer to this as something like a digital direct democracy. That involves not only the ruling class that we see, so Jack Black and Lizzo's characters and the, the sort of council they have eating their wonderful feasts, but also uh, we should look to uh, the interests and the uh, the incentives of the people themselves, since there is such a direct uh, political involvement through democratic means. And so we can employ public choice theory to look at this, to see what exactly would their interests be, how could they and would they realistically make their decisions, and therefore, by looking at who makes what decisions, we can find out who is really in power, what they're really capable of doing with that power, and what uh, what their responses would be to a particular kind of situation, like the uh, like the uh, the violence of the droids spurned on by Christopher Lloyd's character. And so, what we are presented with in the episode uh, is, roughly speaking, a uh, a droid malfunction. So this uh, this society is based around droids uh, fulfilling all productive functions of society. So every function of society that that we would we would expect would require means of production, uh, primarily uh, primarily labor and capital at least, um, is fulfilled by droids. Uh, these are droids that seem to be uh, mostly decommissioned separatist or Confederacy of Independent Systems droids. So former battle droids, as well as some various other protocol droids, drivers, uh, chef droids, other things as well. But these various droids are. Uh, are basically serving as the productive capacity of the society. However, we find out that these droids have been malfunctioning recently and attacking people, destroying property, and going on uh, what can distantly be referred to as rampages. It is important to note, however, that from what we see in the episode at the very least, and now you can maybe chalk this up to, uh, to not to their, to the, producers of the show not wanting to show uh, dismemberment or uh, or the massacre of civilians on a Disney Plus series. But from what we see, the destruction and the mayhem caused by these droids is relatively minor. Just about the worst thing that we see happen uh, is a car crash or a speeder crash, strictly speaking. And so this is a series of unfortunate incidents uh, where People are hurt and property is damaged by droids, which are the productive uh, the productive capacity of this city. The dilemma arises as to uh, whether these droids should be shut down. So to shut down all of the city's droids, at least until uh, at least until um, they're able to discover what's causing this and to correct the problem. This would, of course, most notably, which of course, the characters don't quite acknowledge this, which is troubling. We'll get back to that. But this would completely shut down the productive capacity of the city. It would put their entire economic system to a complete halt. This has, of course, significant repercussions, uh, which are, in the episode, primarily glossed over uh, with a reference to people are used to droids working for them, and this would mean that people have to work for themselves, which is not exactly how this, how this would work, given that the economy is geared around droid service. Uh, this would be a, a very significant economic problem, and because people would be inconvenienced, again, in the episode's description, people would be inconvenienced by the shutting down of the droids, they're willing to uh, allow the damage and the destruction and the mayhem to continue in order to keep their droids and their production uh, working, working properly. This is portrayed in the episode as if it were a foolish decision on the part of the hoi polloi, the demos, who are who are easily swayed by by luxury and convenience and are not thinking particularly clearly. The citizens voted against any interruption in joy services. <laughs> they can't live without it. And why is that? The citizens are no longer required to work. They can spend their days engaging in recreation, the arts and participating in our direct democracy. If we shut down the droids, our citizens wouldn't know how to survive. 
how society would collapse. I'm going to argue a couple of things. First of all, that the, the demos here, the people who voted not to deactivate all of the droids, first of all, that is the absolutely correct decision, given the circumstances. And two, that most likely, um, there's a very high likelihood, at least I would argue, that uh, that a given populace, an average populace, in a city like this, working in this way, would almost certainly vote to deactivate the droids, rather than to keep them activated under these conditions. They would make the wrong decision, in other words, the opposite decision, the one that the show portrays as being the good decision. Or on arguments for these later, I still need to go through a bit of the uh, a bit of the episode. I don't want to. Another thing I don't want to get into that I suppose I should have mentioned is I don't exactly want to get into uh, separatist Doc Brown's uh, motivations here, his political goals. Um, he seems primarily to be interested in uh, in outdated Confederate politics, rather than interested in anything to do with the city as it exists currently. Uh, he was a follower of Count Dooku. He was a separatist, politically speaking, um, in the Clone Wars. But at this stage, that was almost 30 years ago. And it doesn't seem to have any particular impact on his decision-making, aside from there are droids involved, and he doesn't like the way that the city is run. Separatist is a pejorative term. I support democracy not quite made clear and he's not allowed to finish his, his soliloquy he is uh, he is taken down by uh he's taken down by our main characters before he's able to count dooku was a visionary he was cut short in his prime by the jedi forces anyway uh, i do want to kind of set that aside because again the politics uh are too unclear for us to really speculate about. So unfortunately, speculation would uh, would be all that we have. And I'm here to look at uh, look at things in more uh, more carefully in abstract theory. So, part of my argument for why I think that the demos, the populace, would vote to deactivate the uh, deactivate the droids rather than to keep them going. Uh, and risk this uh, these these constant interruptions and the uh, various mayhem and so on and whatnot um, has to do with the nature of a digital direct democracy like this. It has to do with voter participation in the political process, and it has to do with public choice theory, both uh, concerning the voters themselves and concerning uh, the elites of society. It is worth noting here that uh, some of the comments and some of the things I've seen about this found it a bit odd that there seem to be nobility who are ruling a city which is uh, ostensibly ruled by a digital direct democracy, ruled by the will of the people directly. And that that, that should, in theory, mean that there are no such nobility uh, ruling the city. There would be no place for Jack Black and Lizzo's characters. This couldn't be further from the truth. We find historically that the more democratic a society gets, in other words, the more directly and actively more people participate in a society, they do tend to have concentrated figures of power at the top, particularly in larger societies. Uh, this is explained by a few factors. First of all, we have to look at what a direct democracy of, of this sort provides in terms of incentives for voters. Because uh, one of the draws... Uh, one of the bonuses, one of the additional good points of a digital direct democracy is that there is an incredibly low barrier by design to political participation or voting. If you are able to vote on any given measure, uh, vote on any given government initiative, and anyone is capable of doing so at minimal cost to themselves, everyone is capable of doing so and everyone is likely to participate. There would be no particular reason not to. The only reason not to in most societies is opportunity cost. If I'm going to vote in an election every two or four years, I'm going to have to drive down to the voting place, take some time out of my random Tuesday, uh, and take a couple of hours, perhaps, in terms of driving and waiting in line and participating in the process, not even to mention researching the candidates, that I could be spending doing something else. If instead, I can take out my data pad and press a few, uh, with a few keystrokes, submit my votes, 
that has next to no opportunity cost. It's the same opportunity cost as scrolling social media, which is which we do all of the time for a very little reward. And so, in a system like this, it is far more likely that voter turnout would be very close to 100%, at least for issues that most people consider to be important, this being one of them. Um, you know, the, the productive capacity of one's society, as well as the, uh, the constant mayhem produced by malfunctioning droids. So that is one aspect. High voter participation. Extremely high voter participation due to a low opportunity cost for voting. Another element that public choice theory points for, uh, puts forward is that if you have a high voter turnout because of a low opportunity cost for voting, that means that people will place substantially lower value upon their vote and lower value upon their political participation. What this means is that they are less likely to uh, to put effort into uh, examining the issues carefully and closely. This is for a few reasons. First of all, if you have a uh, an expensive product, say, you are far more likely to carefully consider um, how, when, where, and why you're going to purchase it, uh, as to whether uh, as compared to a relatively inexpensive product, because the inexpensive product is uh, is worth a small, uh, a much smaller portion of your time, uh, time and treasure. We might compare, for example, the time you might spend researching an, a uh, car purchase, for example, versus the time you might, uh, you might spend, uh, say, researching a headphone purchase. When I purchased these headphones, I looked through the first page of Amazon results. When I purchased my car, I spent several weeks at several car dealerships and ultimately settled on the one I wound up buying after a careful and considered process. And that's because the cost of the car was several orders of magnitude more than the cost of the average to low quality headphones that I... Uh, actually, they do work quite well, not sponsored or anything, but... They cost less than $100 as opposed to the car, which cost well over 10000 So, that is quite the difference. And so, we are more willing to put in effort when we are putting more of our own lives and our own livelihood and our own wealth at stake. And so what this means in terms of voting is that if voting has no cost or minimal cost, we're far less likely to put a lot of effort into carefully considering it. And so what we have is a large mass of low information voters. And there's another factor that, that, uh, that contributes to this as well. Because voter turnout is much, much higher than it would be in a system where uh, where voting has a higher opportunity cost. Each vote is, compared to all of the others, worth less. What this means is that each vote uh, is less likely to be the deciding vote in any given decision. Because there are more votes to count, each vote is substantially less. It's something like vote inflation, if you want to think of it that way. And so because of this, uh, not only is your cost substantially reduced, and so your lessons, you are no longer as incentivized to be as careful in your decision making, but also the efficacy of your vote is thereby diminished by the sheer number of people participating. And so the chance that your vote will have some political significance is substantially lower as well. And so you're also disincentivized from putting forward a considerable amount of effort in, uh, in deciding what that vote is going to constitute. And so what we have here is... Uh, a confluence of factors that leads to uh, a large number of low information voters. Okay, very crucial. This is important. Because low information voters vote differently or vote on the basis of different things than high information voters. Low information voters are more easily persuaded, uh, persuaded by everyday, um, everyday occurrences, whether that is advertising, whether that is propaganda, outright propaganda, whether that is um, what they happen to hear in the news, whether it's propagandistic or not. High information voters, voters who who rely uh, who rely carefully upon um, <clears throat> information available to them, such that they uh, such that they take the time to research their choices, rely more on deep information rather than broad information. So 
low information voters are more easily persuaded by things like, uh, most notably, propaganda and media. What this gives us in practice in a direct digital democracy is a ruling class of people capable of persuading large numbers of people with a relatively small amount of effort. What we have are people who are adept at propaganda. Now that might be media propaganda, like we're mostly familiar with. That might even simply be, in a small enough community at least, visibility in the community. So if you are running for, say, town council in a town of a few hundred people, one of your best strategies would be to be visibly in the community, uh, putting on a good face, so to speak, so people are more familiar with you. It's simply name and face familiarity. And again, what we see in the episode are uh, our, our town's nobility putting on lavish feasts so that everyone can see them. They're incredibly visible, they're ostentatious, and they are not just candidates, but they are more persuasive to people because of what, th what they say is going to be associated with trustworthiness within the community. A again, by people who aren't thinking about it particularly hard. So what we wind up with in a system like this, in a direct digital democracy, or any substantially high voter turnout uh, democratic system, is a natural elite forming, and that natural elite is formed by people who are the most persuasive on a broad scale. Uh, there's a political philosopher 20th century named Max Weber uh, who put forward the idea of what he called the plebiscitarian Fuhrer democracy, <clears throat> which follows this uh, this line of thinking quite well, or quite closely. This idea, of course, is that, uh, that a direct democratic system uh, will ultimately uh, will ultimately develop into something like an absolutist dictatorship, but the, the dictator is res is responsible directly to the people. And so basically what we will have is a populist demagogue who has absolute political authority so long as he can keep the absolute support of the majority of people through whatever democratic means uh, they have for, legitimate, uh, for legitimization. Part of what this, uh, part of what this, of course, leads to is a uh, is a broad-based democratic society on paper, turning into, in practice, a um, an aristocratic at best or authoritarian at worst uh, monarchy, broadly speaking, rule by the few, uh, or perhaps by the one, or perhaps by even simply the most involved. And often, worth noting as well, those who are most involved are the people who have the most to gain from the political process. That is, people like special interest groups, lobbyists, people who, uh, let's call them grifters, people who make their living off of, uh, off of functions of the state. They're capable of manipulating the, mass, the masses of people, not just because they're better at it, but because uh, uh, their paycheck more or less, depends upon their ability to do so and to get people to pay them, pay them through the democratic process. And so what we wind up with is, again, this, this elite that forms winds up being an elite of, of special interests, of lobbyists, of grifters. So I want to look at another aspect of this as well. So that's part one. Now, I... Part one of this, again, has has been my argument that uh, the population here <clears throat> works in a certain way. This is, uh, right, in terms of it being a direct digital democracy, uh, in terms of it forming a sort of natural elite that is capable of manipulating that, that, uh, that democratic populace in various ways based on their own particular interests. All this is basically just an extrapolation of public choice theory applied to the particular political circumstances that we see in this episode. And now I want to try and argue for both of my conclusions here. First of all, uh, that uh, that choosing not to shut down the droids that were malfunctioning, or all of the droids because some are malfunctioning, uh, that choice was absolutely the correct choice. The reason for this is because, very clearly, the economy of this city is shown to function purely on the basis of these droids. The productive capacity of the city's economy is based entirely upon droid labor in ways that could not easily be replicated through human labor. For example, 
we see in uh, a couple of scenes uh, decommissioned battle droids that are carrying heavy loads. These are presumably loads far heavier than a human would be capable of carrying by their own weight. What we don't see is industrial machinery that would be capable of carrying those same loads. So what we have here is if we decommissioned the, if we, I guess, re-decommissioned these, uh, these former battle droids, if we shut down the droids running the city's economy, they simply could not be replaced by human laborers because human laborers are not capable of, of doing the same things that these droids could do. This is the equivalent of shutting down heavy machinery. It's basically the equivalent of a micro-scale Luddite movement. Shutting down heavy machinery because we want people to say, more directly interact with their work, but it doesn't matter how strong you are, you're not, or what you're, uh, or how many people you are, even people, how many people you have on your team even, you're not going to be able to, uh, to compete with, say, a mechanical backhoe. Industrial machinery, uh, as in its place as capital productive goods, is different in kind from human manual labor. And so, eliminating the capital production goods, in this case droids, from the production cycle is going to not just disrupt, but ultimately completely stop the productive economy of this city. And this will cause all sorts of terrible problems for everyone in the city, absolutely. Without exception, even people who are capable of getting jobs will be significantly harmed by the unavailability of the various goods that they've come to expect. This would be not just a minor inconvenience, this wouldn't just mean that people would suddenly have to work again, this would be a disruption of their entire way of life. It's almost like we've gone through something similarly, uh, similar to this, uh, over the past few years. Because, again, as we've seen over the past few years, uh, if we're talking about shutting down our productive economy, we tried this. Uh, as a world, not just as a uh, particular city or a particular country, we tried shutting down our political economy uh, because there was a uh, a vague and undefined, uh, but ultimately mild danger to certain uh, to some people in an in, in an unpredictable manner. And so, what we did was we shut down our productive economy to a large degree, and it wound up making everyone worse off, except for those people who were directly politically connected, who managed to benefit from it. So this is again the same thing that we wind up, we would wind up seeing, in a situation like this. So that's one side of the coin. The other side is that I think that, especially given the analogy to COVID that we've just seen, that we've just all lived through over the past few years, I would argue that a demos, a democratic population like the one we see in this episode, would almost certainly vote not to continue keeping the droids active, would vote to deactivate them, to hit the kill switch, rather than allowing them to continue working and to continue malfunctioning. Because even though these malfunctions are relatively minor, they are randomly distributed. What this means is we have a continuous low to mid-level threat to everyone, not just to certain people, not just to people in certain circumstances, but because droids are so ubiquitous in this society, the threat is to everyone. And even though it is a relatively minor threat, there is certainly the possibility of you know, horrific injury or death if, say, your driver droid were to, instead of just crashing into a wall after you get out of your speeder, it just crashes into the ground from a thousand feet in the air. That's a possibility. That could, in principle, happen. Everyone is aware that could, in principle, happen. And so people would naturally be afraid of this kind of thing and would disregard the unseen consequences of shutting down droids in the city. Because those consequences are unseen. What they see before their eyes, particularly if they see it in the media, is the damage being done by these malfunctioning droids. Just like during COVID, we didn't see, well, what we've experienced since then. Uh, the uh, the disrupted production lines, the loss of uh, loss of job, loss of income, uh, all of the personal uh, all of the personal uh, issues that have resulted from all of these lockdowns and all of that, we didn't see that at the time. What we were constantly shown were death numbers, particular anecdotal cases of people suffering terribly, all these sorts of things that that inspired a sort of vague and nebulous fear 
which is exactly what you would expect in a situation like this, where any droid, keep in mind that there are droids on every corner, any droid could go horribly wrong and could start destroying things and hurting people. This could, on its own, already provides people with uh, with quite the incentive, not necessarily a rational incentive, but certainly a uh, an incentive given uh, given common perceptions of the low information voter. This would lead uh, almost certainly to uh, to a majority voting to deactivate all of the droids. Add on top of that, <clears throat> the elite of the city who clearly are in favor of doing so. And the manipulability of the people, especially through means like the spread of fear, and you have an almost certainty that the vast majority of people would vote to deactivate the droids. And so we don't see what we, we, we shouldn't see, what we see in the episode. We should not see the people resolutely saying, oh, we will not shut down these droids, they're too convenient. Rather, you would be saying, no, we have to shut down these droids, they're too scary. So this leads to one further conclusion that I hadn't alluded to, which is that I think, or at least I suspect, that this episode serves as a sort of pro-lockdown propaganda. Now, it's a little late, but it's important to remember that this was in production at, during the height of the COVID hysteria. And a lot, of, uh, a lot of Hollywood producers and Hollywood writers are, of course, in that cultural milieu where... Uh, where locking down is the single moral thing to do under the circumstances. And so, why I say this episode in particular is because, first of all, there's a very clear analogy between shutting down a, uh, a society's productive capacity because, there is, because there's a nebulous danger, uh, and then also the perspective of the sort of pro-lockdown view is that the demos, the, the mass of people, the people that they don't interact with but they hear from quite a bit, are arguing that this danger is not that big a deal and that we should keep going about our daily lives even though there is a significant danger to us. And that they think that that is a bad, stupid, benighted, and sometimes even evil view to hold. And wouldn't you know it, that is exactly the view that the episode takes. It's that the people, the demos, are stupid for, uh, for not shutting down the droids until they can figure out what's wrong. It's put forward as if the people obviously should shut down the droids, but they've refused to because it would be inconvenient to them. I'm, I'm, I'm almost surprised that there wasn't a reference to you just to someone just wanted to get a haircut and there was a haircutting droid that went crazy or something. Uh, we got close. There was a chef droid, I suppose. So maybe that's a reference to wanting people wanting to go to restaurants. Because if you recall, that was one of the major talking points of the pro lockdown crowd that that uh, anti-lockdowners just wanted to get their hair cut or just wanted to go to a restaurant. Um, and because of this, uh, they refused to do the sensible thing, as they saw it, and shut down the entire productive economy uh, until this uh, this disease could be somehow dealt with. This, this vague, nebulous, mid-to-low-level threat could be dealt with. And so what we see in the episode, as I said, is uh, is that view, the view that no, we should keep our society functional and keep our entire populace out of destitution. That view is being portrayed as silly and selfish and getting in the way of solving the problem. Uh, and of course, the problem is solved because it's an episodic show uh, and they're going to solve the problem before the episode is over. And they wind up solving it, of course. Uh, but it's also, again, worth noting, they solve the problem without shutting down the city's productive economy. Perfectly well. Without any problems. Without any serious problems, I suppose. So again, this is something to watch out for. It, it, to look for, uh, first of all, I, I mean, I will give it. I will give the show credit that this is a relatively subtle message. This isn't beating you over the head uh, until you're uh, in, until you can't help but see what the message is supposed to be. This is a return to a sort of subtle, uh, subtle form of propagandistic storytelling in science fiction. However, it's still propagandistic storytelling, and it's still propaganda for an evil point of view. As I've ex as I've explored before, when I uh, when I looked into the issue of wokeness in media, again, link below if you haven't seen that video. 
I argue there that if a story or if a piece of media is putting forward a bad lesson, even if it's doing it well, that's worse than putting forward a good lesson. Or even that's worse than putting forward a bad lesson poorly. And so this episode is, I think, particularly insidious. It's not just bad in terms of some of its production. It's bad because it's putting forward a bad message, and it's doing so in a subtle manner that isn't uh, that isn't overly obvious or ham-fisted, like we like we see in a lot of uh, sort of propagandistic storytelling these days. So this is a, I guess, take this video uh, first of all as as an analysis of a particular episode, but but more than that, as a reminder to look a little bit more carefully at some of the media that we watch, the good, the bad, and the in-between, uh, to look beneath the surface and to see if there is anything to see down there uh, that is either intended or just sort of comes up that we can take a lesson from and that we should be taking that lesson from it. Anyway, that's all I have for this time. So thank you for joining me. I'm Professor McCoy. I'll see you next time.